Last week, I locked my three sons in my garage and forced them to compete against me in a battle of physical endurance. It resulted in two of them throwing up and one left unable to stand. I was fine. They accused me of acting like a pathetic poor man's YouTube version of Tom Cruise, running everywhere, doing my own stunts, desperate to still pretend I'm relevant in a modern world that ultimately they'll be running one day, no matter what I do. And could I not just accept that? I said, hmm, maybe, but not today. Christmas 2020, and I invented and then set the world record for the sport of a man and his dog climbing out to Zwift, a very steep climb within the computerized land of Zwift, where cyclists sweat profusely in their sheds and spare bedrooms, while cartoon versions of themselves ride around in a virtual world. Christmas 21, I did it again. Ah, 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 ah. And then in the summer of 2022, this happened. Mark, Nixon, we're coming for you. That is Mitch the American and his dog Vivian. They did the same climb and beat our time. Now I argue it doesn't qualify because I've eaten burgers that weigh more than that thing. But in their defense, when I created the man dog event, I never set a weight limit as part of the rules. I never expected someone to rock up with something they stole from Paris Hilton's handbag. It was my mistake. So going into Christmas 22, I had an issue. There was no way I was gonna beat Mitch's new world record. And as I was, still am, heavier than I have been in months, there was little chance of even beating my own previous times. So what could I beat? That's right, what says Christmas better than crushing a small gathering of little Gen Zs? And what the hell, my wife wasn't busy either, so I threw in a millennial too. And so I'm off. And here was the plan. Christmas Eve, I had logged into my Zwift account and I had altered my weight to 117 kilos, or 258 pounds to our American friends, or 109 Vivians. That's 105 kilos for me and 12 kilos for Nixon. Zwift then takes that data, along with my height that it already knows, and uses a very complex mathematical algorithm to calculate that I am big and fat and heavy. And that is quite relevant here, because when I start pedaling, the bike will send my wattage output to Zwift, and it is then able to take my size, the steepness of the virtual hill that I'm going up, and the power that I am generating, to have my little cycling avatar progress forward at a speed that it thinks I would be doing in real life. A speed so slow that I was occasionally being overtaken by people jogging. I assume you can somehow hook a treadmill up to Zwift as well, and that isn't people that have tried out the London map and just got their bike stolen. By the way, the kids at this point waiting their turn, carb loading on Cocoa Pops. Now, if you follow the channel, you'll know that I normally ride this route with a note of my corner times from previous rides. That way I can break the zigzagging course into 21 separate corners and then aim to get to each one based on what I've done before. I didn't bother here because I knew my weight and the fact that I haven't really done much cycling on Zwift in 2022 meant that the challenge was just gonna be getting to the top. And getting to the first of those 21 corners showed there was definitely no point worrying about the clock at all. I normally hit this corner in under four minutes. Here, I did it in almost five and a half. Immediately, I set myself a goal of under 90 minutes as being good enough. And I aim to keep my average power around 240 watts which for me is pretty low. When I rode up here sub 60 minutes, I was around 100 kilos and averaged 320 watts, giving me 3.2 watts per kilo, which is the exact amount of power needed to go under the hour. And there's not much more to say about my climb. It's a man in his garage with his dog on his bike, sweating. It is what it is. We hit the halfway point in around 42, 43 minutes. So I knew the sub 90 minutes was gonna be okay for the finish, but that was good and bad at the same time because while that was my target, it's still pretty slow for me. And the idea of getting to 60 minutes in and still having about half an hour to ride was pretty grim. But anyway, we push on and slog our way up the hill. It's probably also worth mentioning here that every time I post a video like this, somebody will question whether Nixon is happy. So for anybody about to jump into the comments and ask that, please look at this. <laughs> That's a dog at one with his master, a belly full of doggy snacks, and listening to a Clarence Clemens saxophone solo. Is he happy? It doesn't get any better.
So we make it to the top in 1 hour 26 27 seconds, and so immediately my mind turned to two things. Firstly, the realisation that I am way too heavy and unfit. I will never ride again in such terrible shape. And two, it's now quite likely that my children will beat me and regard themselves as having achieved some sort of elevated position within the hierarchy of the house. That is not ideal either. So I'll explain how four different people can all ride the same bike up the same hill at the same time in a minute. First, let's just watch the start, because as it turns out, it is the only time that I'm actually in the lead. Harvey is first on the bike, and because he crosses the start line, producing the sort of power output that is low enough for a doctor to legally declare you dead, he starts slower than me. And that can be seen by the ghost bike in front, which represents my previous attempt from 90 minutes before. However, it quickly becomes apparent that even though Harvey is generating weakling child levels of output, he is gaining on me. Because while my ride was based on me being 6 foot 6 and 117 kilos, his ride is not. What we did was take a total of their four heights and then the total of their four weights and divide by four to find the average which was a height of about 6 foot and a weight of 72 kilos. That average person is the data that we've put into Zwift for their ride. It means Harvey's watts per kilo, which is really how Zwift calculates most of what it's doing, is actually higher than mine. The extra power that I was generating was not enough to compensate for the extra 45 kilo weight difference. And as a result, it's not long until Harvey actually goes past me, much to the amusement of the others in the garage. So not going great at this point. I've now just been overtaken by somebody that looks like they're on their way to featuring a viral TikTok, kicking iPads off the display counter of an Apple store. And then it gets worse. Because the rules of this challenge are that each of them must pedal for at least one minute, never longer than six minutes, and must take it in turns going in age order. So when Harvey jumps off, Joshua jumps on. <laughs> and this is the reason why they're all quite excited. Joshua is huge. While Harvey is in real life about the same height and weight as their 72 kilo average rider, Joshua is closer to my size, so him doing 400 watts at a weight 20 kilos below his real weight produces a watt per kilo he could never do in real life, and they expect him to crush it every time he's on the bike. I should add at this point, if you recognise Joshua, yes, it was him who featured in the Christmas food video where I ate vegan and he stuffed meat into his mouth. That's what she said. And unlike his brothers, Joshua also the only one happy to show his face on camera. Harvey had told me that he'd be bullied at school. I did simply suggest that he punched the bully in the face, to which he explained that physical violence was no longer how bullying took place nowadays. It was all via technology and I simply wouldn't understand. I disputed that and said that I had actually had a fax machine thrown at my head in 1987, but apparently that doesn't count. Back to Joshua. And it was pleasant to see that working against him is the fact that he has zero endurance. He got off the bike and had to sit on the floor after his go. Would that be, would that be one round so far, Joshua? One round and he's, he's dead. Uh, Joshua is their secret weapon. George took over from Joshua and, like Harvey, is fairly close to the average size rider, so nothing particularly exciting and noteworthy about his performance, other than he, for some reason, came dressed as Billy Hoyle. And last of all to take a turn is Jen, who after a year of training is actually the fittest of all of them, but at only 55 kilos is riding with a huge weight disadvantage. So as soon as the gradient gets steep, she's in real trouble. Despite all that, as Harvey gets back on for his second go, as they go past corner 17, they count down from 21, and at that same time, I was not even at corner 18 yet. So I spend the next 20 minutes or so quite worried that they are going to destroy me. I also have to endure the most horrific clash of music tastes I have ever heard. I go in my and then ironically, given they're sat on a bike with no wheels, the wheels start to come off. As Jenna is approaching the halfway corner, 10, in a pretty respectable and much faster than me 30 minutes, 
cracks begin to appear. Little gangster is no longer unable to stand unaided, and Jenna struggling hugely, trying to pedal while weighing so much more than she really does. And I started to wonder if, much like the tale of the hare and the tortoise, if the hare was to race on ahead and be so lacking in fitness that it died, I might win after all. And then a few corners from the top, I became pretty convinced I might. I don't know if it was his insistence on listening to Taylor Swift on a permanent loop, or the actual cycling, but something was making George very unwell indeed. To be fair to George, the last time he rode a bike it didn't require pedalling, so he's out of his element here. Either way, this did not look like a team in good shape. And next to drop was Harvey. My chest hurts so bad. And this was quite crucial because as they approached the final corner, heading up for the run to the finish line, George is dying. He can't even get 150 watts out. There's no way he has another 30 seconds left in him at all. He's done. So next up will be Jenna. But because of the disadvantage in weight, it's going to be impossible for her to get from there to the top inside the six minutes, which is the longest time any single rider is allowed to ride. She'll have to get off before the top. Unfortunately for them, what they want to do is then stick Joshua on, who could actually get them to the top. But Harvey is next in line to ride, and cycling out of order means they lose. Harvey, how are you feeling? You okay? How do you think I feel, man? We, we also use dog crisps. Okay. Uh. And Harvey is too sick to ride, vomiting every two minutes. Oh, bro. And so they hatch a plan, which is simply to put Harvey on the bike and hope he can survive for the minimum one minute that he needs to do before Joshua can take over and finish. And with that, Jenna gives it one last blast before Harvey is due to jump on. I don't know if Harvey is trying to avoid the bright lights of the garage or retain any vomit inside his hoodie, but somehow he manages a minute, allowing his big lump of a brother to then jump on and finish things off. 10 minutes, 10 get seconds, on, push, it, push, it, push it, push it, it's right there. it push it, push it, push it, get him, get him. <laughs> one hour, eight minutes, 12 seconds. So, in a way, they kind of won, despite me and Nixon pointing out to them that they had only raced a quarter each of what I had done, and at a vastly reduced weight. They still felt some level of satisfaction from their performance, a sort of sense of pride in their achievement, and that's how it might have remained if it weren't for the scene that I witnessed on Christmas morning the next day, when each of them staggered very gently downstairs, in a style that suggests that there were parts of their bodies not used to being sat upon something rigid while thrashing about, even for a short duration. Jen was fine, she's much more used to doing that. She's used the bike before. So did they win? Yes, but did they have to open their presents from Santa while stood unable to sit? Yes to that too. So should we call that a tie? I think so. In fact, I asked them all if they wanted a rematch on that basis, to which they replied, Maybe so, sir. But not today. That's not true. They said no, not a f***ing hope. Give the video a like and click over here to subscribe and then jump over here to come join us on the Patreon page and I will see you guys on the next one.